Bill's Fair Society. But I'm Mike Truax, and it's really good to see so many members here for the second time in three weeks. Got it. Now, we all know, and you don't get tired of me saying this this year, the 118th anniversary of the opening of the World's Fair and the 36th anniversary of the first meeting of our society. Today, we'll be revisited by Armin Sager. You last visited, you? visited yes, I don't need you, Rick. 2013 which was about nine years ago. He was a St. Charles resident and teacher, and he'll tell us about his visits to the 1904. Neil, maybe that just left because it's being uh, first, I want to see if there's any new members or people here uh, who haven't been here in a long, long time. Of course, that's most of, you know, a lot of us. <laughs> but uh, if you're a guest or uh, a potential new member, please raise your hand and tell us your name, how you found out about us, and any special interest you have in the fair. No, no, no guests or anything. Maybe please. Where is that? I didn't even see what you're talking about. Okay, so exit out. You're saying? Yes. I came to a meeting, but it's been a long time. Okay. Let's see a restart. Well, put your name in the box. Maybe you're going to win a prize today. Okay. Okay. Um, You're not your mom. Did I miss somebody? Jesse's running around and Mark is getting hugged all over the place. Glad you could make it. <laughs> A couple of quick administrative remarks. Number one, please be sure and silence your cell phones. Uh, we will be recording this meeting, and David is probably already recording for the people out there in Zoom land. How many people do we have out there, do you think? Twenty-five, but several now. Okay, seventy, twenty-five, and uh, there's several couples, so maybe about thirty people out there. I'm guessing about thirty-five or so people here, so we have a really good crowd tonight. Um, I hope you all signed up for attendance prizes. We've got a, one really nice piece of china back there, and some uh, books from the World's Fair, etc. A couple of announcements, uh, as usual. Be sure and visit the Society website regularly. Uh, the upgraded website, and we're working on it, provides information about meetings, and they are changing regularly. I'm sure Mark can tell us all about the changes. Yes? Changes? No, I can't tell you that. Okay. <laughs> uh, most of the presentations have been reported over the last year, and if you go to the Society's Facebook group page and check your email, there was an email link there that will take you to YouTube, and you can go see all those meetings over the last year or so. Uh, I'm going to ask the board members in general, we have a few board members that may have a little bit of information about uh, uh, some things that are coming up or whatever. Dan Fuller couldn't be here, unfortunately, or I'm sure he'd tell us something about our financials. But other board members uh, in the back or in the crowd, anything to report or share with the membership? Okay, guess not. Uh, I have a special request for the people out on Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions for our presenter or about the video, please enter them into the Zoom comments panel for now, and we will read those at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to set the stage for this presentation uh, in two ways. One is, uh, what happened 117, 18 years ago? The Thursday, May 17th, 1904 was a sunny day, as were most of the days uh, at the fair. The fair had been open for over two weeks and the final exhibits were still being set up and the pike concessions were almost all open. The first session of the National Editorial Association opened in the Hall of Congresses. Over 400 congresses or conventions and meetings would be held in the Missouri Granite Building on the Washington University camp campus. Washington University used the structure now known as Ridgely Hall which originally cost $250,000 as a library after the fair. The LPE company complained to the county court about residents that were living north of the pike around De Hodiamont and De Giver. They were still using the River de Pair stream as a sewer. That area was near where the river entered the wooden channels that carried the pesky stream under the fairgrounds to the eastern part of Forest Park. Follow-up actions, if any, were not uh, reported. 
The giant turntable in the Palace of Transportation began turning. A locomotive weighing over 200,000 pounds, that's 100 tons, was lifted up and mounted on this turntable so that the wheels did not touch the track. It was called the spirit of the 20th century and the CCC and St. Louis Big Four line locomotives wheels revolved at great speed while the electric headlight threw its beam around the entire interior of the building. So if I had a laser light and I held that laser light and went all the way around this room, that would kind of be what that uh, train's headlight would do even in the uh, kind of dim afternoon. Uh, and that was one of the more interesting things. Can you imagine lifting something 100 tons onto a section of track that wasn't really holding it, but the turntable would spin? The inertia of getting something like that turning uh, was not insignificant. So now it's time for our presentation. I'd like to tell you about Armin Sager and how his documented memories came into our possession. And be sure to stay for the attendance prize drawings uh, afterwards. Uh, apologies on behalf of Aberdeen for the uh, somewhat higher normal than temperature and uh, uh, kind of humidity to go with it, but we'll get right into this. So early in 2012, I was contacted by Dawn Hashbarger of Kirkwood, Missouri. She said that she was tracking down a family history written by a cousin of her mother-in-law in the 1970s. When she found it, she was kind enough to give us a copy. It's a fascinating and entertaining look at the World's Fair. Armin Sager documented his recollection in September 1974, remembering when he went to the 1904 World's Fair as a 12 year old. So he was born, if you do the math, in 1892, 12 years old in 1904. And by the time 1974 came around, he was 82 years old when he made this recollection of the fair. Quote, rummaging through 70 year old memory files. He wrote or tape recorded his recollections at the request of his cousin, Ruth Hashbarger, since he had referred to the 1904 World's Fair as he was doing this family recollection, which has since been collected as a booklet called Memories of Freedoms. Armin Sager died on Christmas Day, 1988, and served as a school teacher for, I think, 45 years up in the Francis Howell School District. Uh, I'm sorry, his father was a school teacher for 45 years in the Francis Howell School District before 1904 when he brought his family to the fair. And so. so with that, I would like to introduce Armin Sager. <laughs> I decided I was going to leave my dressed up stuff out somewhere else because it's just too hot. Yeah. And when I was 12, I didn't care what it felt like at the fair, it just really didn't care. Well, let me see if I can get my recollections going again. Well, the day had arrived the day of my first visit to the World's Fair in St. Louis. We passed through a turnstile entrance gate. Father, mother, nine-year-old Albert and I, and suddenly, like Alice in Wonderland, we find ourselves in a new world of fabulous splendor. The goal of my daydreams was at last becoming reality for what 12-year-old hadn't heard of the World's Fair. Our history lessons had taught us why the Louisiana Purchase was important to us and to our country. Also in school, we had produced our very best written work on specially provided sheets, very official looking sheets, as our part in a statewide effort to display our schools to the World's Fair visitors who would, we imagine, peruse our efforts with care and would, we hope, marvel at the accomplishments of America's free public schools. Of course, we had already seen pictures of the fair in newspapers and magazines. 
Now we would see it with our own eyes. Not far beyond the entrance gate, the miracle began to unfold as a fairyland of palaces, statuary, lagoons, fountains, cascades, and ever more palaces filled our eyes. In the distance loomed the fabulous Ferris wheel, already famous from its Chicago days, as well as to us children from albums of the Chicago Fair, albums that our elders preserved as mementos of their great fair long, long ago in 1893. Ah, but this fair, our fair, would outshine Chicago's effort. The 1900 equivalent of Madison Avenue publicity had convinced us that our Missouri metropolis would show the world. Yes, ours was the show me state. Already two years before, my uncle and aunt from St. Louis, whom I was visiting, had on a Sunday afternoon taken my cousin and me out to Forest Park to the site of the fair in order to see for ourselves what progress was being made in constructing a World's Fair. I remember seeing scaffolding for buildings, but I recall mainly that great terrain was chewed up a hundred times more thoroughly than a freshly plowed field. I saw large trees being moved and the river de Pair being roofed over so that, as I was informed, it would flow in a tunnel under the area of the fair. Now, two years later, this jungle of construction had been transformed as if by magic into almost unbelievable beauty. Yes, the fair was for real. And I was there in the midst of it. St. Louis was not letting us down. We walk and walk in order to take in as much as possible of the totality from many points of view. The palaces stand near one another, but not in row after monotonous row, like office buildings along the prosaic city street. Instead, these avenues are laid out in sweeping curves. There are plazas, monuments, countless statues of every imaginable form, and everywhere colorful beds of flowers. A unique sunken garden lies between two of the palatial structures. I think to myself, sunken, it ought to have been sunken much deeper deserved that name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, we boys are gazing and bombarding our dear parents with questions. Soon they realize that we can see no more than a fraction of the fair in one day. Papa remarks that uncle and aunt have season tickets. I ask, what's a season ticket? Can we have season tickets? The answer was no. We live 25 miles from the fair, and besides, we can't afford it. But this is no time for dejection. The present moment is too overwhelming. So we pause for long minutes near the Louisiana Purchase Monument, which is a focal point from which we can enjoy a truly impressive view of Festival Hall. Flanked on both sides by a colonnade of states, namely the states that were carved out of the 1803 purchase from France. Spectacular cascades splash down giant stairways into a placid lagoon on which we see real Venetian gondolas <coughs> made by gondoliers from Greece, Venice, who incidentally and happily know how to sing. <laughs> Everything is quite incredible to the young lad from rural St. Charles County, Missouri. Maybe it's all a dream. If it is, please God, don't let me wake up. Several hours pass like minutes. Pangs of hunger make themselves felt. That, I think, never happens in dreams. Albert is hungry too, and Papa and Mama know it's time to find a restaurant, a fairly inexpensive one. Get off the earth and take a ride to the automobile, shouts a barker through his megaphone. We pause a moment to see forerunner of today's auto buses, mere embryos, like oversized Surreys with about five seats across, each wide enough for several not too fat persons. <laughs> Their noisy motors were underneath because there was no forward hood. It would be nice for tired legs to get off the earth, but alas, the fare is too high. 
We aren't automobile people. We're horse and buggy folks. Even more inviting are the wonderful rolling chairs for two with a pusher walking behind. But he demands a fee that's even further beyond our means. So we step lively and eventually find a middle-class restaurant, a nice gestetta in our German mother tongue, where it isn't a faux pas to supplement what we can afford from its menu with home sandwiches of our own that our mother produces from her handbag. Papa remarks that this wouldn't be permitted in the fine restaurant where a relative of ours is earning college expense money as a cashier. I say to myself, what a wonderful job to be at the fair every day. I wish I were big. A student like my cousin and a waiter right here in the midst of the world's fair. This, this was from my dad, Dr. Lewis Goble. At any rate, we make do at our modest gestata. Soon we feel so refreshed and revived that we two youngsters are positively itching to continue exploring wonders yet to be seen. It has been decided that now is time to enter the first palace, for which our elders have wisely chosen the palace of electricity. Papa knows how fascinated I am with electricity. A little battery operated motor had been under the Christmas tree last Christmas. On our way to the palace, I asked, where's the Liberty Bell? In the Pennsylvania building, we'll see it on another day. Great, that'll mean we get to come back another day. <laughs> I'll remember that promise. We visited several other palaces on this first afternoon, but my memory fails to record the details. However, I can see mother buying a souvenir at a Swiss exhibit, a little carving for enshrining her watch when it's not in use, and some Swiss chocolate bars, definitely a first for us kids. Out in the open again, we are startled by the roar of a cannon and the rattling of musketry coming from somewhere in the distance. It is the bizarre reenactment of two battles of the Boer War, a war of recent memory in which our sympathies had been with the Boers of South Africa. On a later visit with relatives, we saw this, to me, very risk realistic performance. I was impressed with the horrors of a battlefield, men falling dead, horses falling, but not dead enough to keep their tails from swishing. And finally, a bearded Boer general standing high on a gun carriage waving a flag. Victory over the British, I think he surrendered after the second battle. But as, un as usual, unpleasant episodes have a tendency to fade from memory. And so I can't say that I remember seeing him surrender. On that same visit, as guests of my mother's cousins, I also had the unforgettable thrill of a ride on the Ferris wheel. After paying our fare, we could remain on board for as many revolutions as we liked. We revolved twice. And my recollection is really bad on that one. While riding the wheel, we weren't strapped on a chair, like on a small sideshow Ferris wheel. Don't forget, this was a masterpiece in steel of the engineer Ferris. We rode in comfortable cars that in size were larger than the present day VW Bugs. There were windows on all sides. Each car accommodated dozens, perhaps as many as 50 or 60 passengers. We had ours to ourselves. The seats were movable, chairs just like a regular household chair. The device rotated very slowly, stopping to discharge and admit passengers as each car reached ground level. One revolution lasted about 15 or 20 minutes. When our car was rising upwards, there were always other cars ahead of us. And a little higher, but when we had reached the very top, 250 feet high, there were no longer other cars above us, only wide blue sky. Then all of us experienced an eerie feeling, so high up and alone in space. <clears throat> At that very moment, the wheel stopped causing the car to sway gently. This added another bit of nervousness, but 
but not enough to keep us from the thrill of a second revolution. I, of course, wanted even more. The time was being consumed at an alarming rate. We would not tarry longer, not even on the Ferris wheel. In pulling together these boyhood memories of the fair, it is impossible to relive each individual visit there. I cannot even remember how I often, how often I enjoyed that privilege. What I am doing now is arranging my various mental pictures into a not incongruous pattern of my days at the fair. The whole series to include most remembered adventures in this unique wonderland, for which I didn't need Alice's magic mirror. Nevertheless, I knew all the while that this beautiful reality was destined to endure for only a few fleeting months. Perhaps I unconsciously urged myself to make hay while the sun shines, and that is perhaps why so many images have been retained. My father's pedagogical training and background made me realize how marvelously educational the fair could be for a 12 year old and saw to it that once in a lifetime opportunity was used insofar as our limited means allowed. Besides, I was probably no longer a break on parental determination to keep going since I was beyond the age of childhood whines and whims, and my young legs held up better during a long day at the fair than those of the grown-ups. In short, I went along. Exhibits from foreign lands were everywhere, with one exception. Russia wasn't represented because the land of the czars was disastrously involved in a war with Japan from 1904 to 1905. There was much anti-Russian sentiment in the United States, which that country, too preoccupied with the war, did not try to counteract with good exhibits. <clears throat> By contrast, the enterprising Japanese made the most of their chance to advertise, to their, put their best foot forward. We noted their exhibits in palace after palace. The names and often the mental pictures of all the palaces are remembered. Palace of Electricity, Palace of Machinery, which was very fascinating, Varied Industries, Mining and Metallurgy, Education, Transportation, Liberal Arts, Fine Arts, Manufacturers, Agriculture, Forestry, and an imposing United States government building. Foreign lands had their own houses or pavilions. The states did too, our Missouri State Building being the most outstanding one, as I well recall. Regretfully, we failed to go inside before it was vetted by fire, which reminds me that the fair had its own ever alert fire department. It was horse drawn, of course, and it displayed St. Louis's finest. You may be sure. Besides the Missouri Building, I remember only the one that represented Washington because of its unique design. Eight tremendous logs of great length and diameter were set up in a manner so that they embraced the state building. There they stood as evidence of the tall trees of the Northwest. The inserted structure, as I remember it, had about five full stories. The German building is clearly remembered not only because it was imposing, being a replica of one of the royal palaces, but also because it was situated on a hillock and thus invited attention. In my memory, if my memory doesn't deceive me, it was somewhere at the fair that I saw the massive bronze eagle, which since 1911 has been a feature on the main floor of the Wanamaker store in Philadelphia. Meet me at the Eagle was a familiar catchword for arranging rendezvous with friends on shopping days. While waiting at this Eagle, one may be listening to a famous pipe organ, the one that was originally in Festival Hall at the St. Louis Fair, then the world's largest organ. Renowned musicians came on invitation and gave organ recitals in Festival Hall. This great organ of five manuals became a white elephant after the fair. It lay in storage for several years because no church could accommodate its monstrous proportions. And motion picture palaces had not yet come into being. In the 1920s, such theaters would have vied for it. 
Finally, John Wanamaker acquired it for his new store building, which was dedicated in 1911. My father told me that his brother, Frank, a well-known organist in St. Louis, had played on the great instrument, but I can't say if for a recital or just as a privilege granted to a St. Louis organist. The central part of the Palace of Fine Art was built for permanence, since it was to become the St. Louis Art Museum. At the time of the fair, this central part was flanked on each side by wings of similar architecture. I know we visited the art gallery because I've retained a certain memory and smiled to myself at the episode. I am passing through one of the galleries on the coattails of great uncle George past a life-size female nude. Rubens or no, such art is considered unsuitable visual nourishment for hungry 12-year-old eyes. <laughs> I mustn't get an eyeful, lest innocence be corrupted. So I am pushed ahead energetically. However, I must report that I got an eyeful anyway. <laughs> Otherwise, why this clear memory picture? For months before and during the fair, the Sunday edition of the St. Louis Globe Democrat provided color reproductions of many of the world's great art treasures that were on view at the Palace of Fine Art. These prints were of fairly good quality. I saved them and kept them for years as my own little art collection. Even took a few to hang in my room at college. Incidentally, there were no nudes among them. A family newspaper during the time of the Victorian morality would not have dared. The fair was spread out over several hundred acres of Forest Park. Visitors often complained about the walking that was necessary. Was there no inexpensive transportation available for those who couldn't afford an auto bus or an elegant rolling chair? Well, yes, there was. An electric trolley line encircled the perimeter of the fair within the fence-like enclosure. It was therefore called the Intramural Railway. It was inexpensive to ride, had frequent station stops, and was considered a necessity for a fair as expensive as the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. Besides the 250-foot Ferris wheel, there were two other ways of enjoying a bird's eye view of the grounds. A captive balloon took the more daring ones aloft to a great height. Sometimes one could get a glimpse of, of its passengers standing in a wicker gondola with their heads peering over the edge. I assume that such a balloon ascension was expensive. And then there was a very tall tower with an elevator to its top. It resembled a gigantic oil well derrick. I think it also served as an aerial for the Marconi wireless exhibit. Wireless telegraphy was then the latest miracle of communication. This tower stood out against the night sky when thousands of electric light bulbs outlined its shape. After the fair, it was dismantled and then re-erected in Creepoor Lake near St. Louis, where it remained for years as a familiar attraction. I didn't get to its top until 10 years later on an outing into Creepoor Lake. Sometimes if we happen to look skyward, we would see a sausage-shaped dirigible airship, small of course, with a whirling propeller. And this propeller, believe it or not, was activated by the solitary aviator, aviator himself by means of bicycle pedals. There were no airplanes, not yet in 1904. Most of the amusements at the fair were concentrated along a broad pedestrian concourse called the Pike, on both sides of which were arranged the most intriguing facades imaginable. Near their ticket windows stood the usual megaphone equipped barkers, giving their spiels, hoping to indulge in vagal customers to pay and come in. It must not be assumed that the pike was the devil's broad avenue to depravity. Many of the attractions were reputed to offer worthwhile entertainment, many of them quite innocent amusements. If the fair had any disreputable sideshows, I would, of course, have had no knowledge of that. We paid for under and over the sea, 
a well-depicted preview of a submarine voyage under the Atlantic to Paris, with interesting porthole views of what was imagined to be deep sea life. The return trip was via airship, and there was a violent storm en route. We saw the educated horse and were amazed at his ability to spell three-letter words and to do simple additions. We watched but did not ride the shoot the shoot, satisfied as onlookers while boatloads of hilariously screaming people slid down a high watery inclined plane with a burst of spray splashed into a lagoon below. Thereupon, a cable pulled the boat back up again, ready for the next load of thrill seekers to come screaming down. The young country boy from St. Charles had never witnessed such a sight before. Since then, I must have seen similar ones, but only this one hadn't vanished into the limbo of forgotten events and scenes. Simply walking leisurely the length of the pike for evening relaxation after exhibit buildings were closed was fun. Thousands enjoyed the mile-long stroll, of whom only a fraction yielded to the megaphone in Balin's and urgings. Come on in and see the story of creation enacted before your very eyes. Come on, come on. Next show is ready to begin. Don't miss this chance of a lifetime, only 50 cents. <laughs> We didn't get to see creation spectacle. I wonder if perhaps Papa feared that there might be an Adam and Eve scene. <laughs> we also took in attractions that were off the pipe. Besides the Boer War, I remember visiting a large scale reproduction of the most historic part of Jerusalem, including a famous gate through the city wall, a marketplace alive with noisy vendors and souvenirs, and a great mosque. It wasn't far from the Ferris wheel from which we had had a good view of the Holy City. More remarkable to me, and I hope my younger brother was along on that day, was Hagenbach's Wild Animal Show. The famous zoo from Hamburg, Germany, had an outstanding exhibit which included performances of some of the animals. Here, for the first time, Americans could see the realistic way in which Higginbeck showed wild creatures in their natural surroundings. Water-filled moats intervened between us and the wild bears of the jungle, but these moats were not visible to the spectators. If I'm not mistaken, this exhibit was the impetus that led to the establishment of the present justly renowned St. Louis Zoo. One afternoon, we visited an extensive Philippine exhibit showing Moros and Igorots in their exotic native surroundings. Only a half dozen years had elapsed since the war with Spain, so you can imagine public interest. I remember watching a brown skinned native making fire with his primitive friction device. I suppose that all of this was probably a free display provided by the US government. Not far away were American Indians in native costumes. And there, there we bought bows and arrows, genuine Indian, hand, Indian handicraft with little labels which said, made in Japan. <laughs> Remember I said Japan was making a, their way into the fair there. Ah, yay, I almost forgot. At the fair, we saw our first motion picture. I may have been in a palace of electricity. However, its subject matter indicated agriculture for the flickering movie showed apple picking in progress in what seemed to be an extensive orchard. This was another free demonstration. What a thrill. We had heard about moving pictures but had not yet seen any. After this, it wasn't long before Nickelodeons mushroomed into cities and towns through the land. Another well-remembered attraction, instructive and educational, was the life-saving drill performed by the U.S. Coast Guard. The small lake where it took place was somewhere near the Ferris wheel. A simulated wreck, distressed sailors clinging to a mast, lay partly submerged. Presently, the Coast Guard hauled forth a small cannon and speedily shot a lifeline over the rigging of the ship. Thereupon, its crew 
hauled in a heavier line, made it fast to the mast, and before long, a trousers buoy was running back and forth along the road, ferrying the shipwrecked sailors one by one to safety at the shore. And we cheered. This was another facet of the government exhibits, most of which were to be seen in the U.S. government building. Of course, we viewed what the U.S. Weather Bureau had to show because one of father's hobbies was the weather. For years, he had been a volunteer observer using instruments supplied by the Weather Bureau. Vividly remembered is the interior mechanism at the top of the lighthouse where the great light was located. We marveled at the intricate polished glass arrangements that controlled the beam and guided ships at sea. Other government exhibits held our parents' attention and probably mine too, but I only remember the lighthouse. Memory can be spotty. Near the Palace of Agriculture, sloping down from its main entrance was a four o'clock that measured about 100 feet in diameter. I asked Papa if it was true that the flowers opened at 12 o'clock exactly at noon. Nonsense, who told you that, canard? He used the German word for canard, intake. A long reign, the long reign of Queen Victoria had ended in 1901, only a few years before the Louisiana's purchase exposition. Hence, her diamond jubilee gifts were on display, attracted many visitors, including us. Queen of Great Britain, as well as Empress of India, and of an empire on which the sun never set, she had received gifts from all over the world, from Oriental potentates, from other rulers within her domain, and from non-British lands as well. I can remember seeing cases with precious jewelry, and more and more display cases, which I know not what. I seem to see in my mind's eye gorgeous trappings from some royal elephant. A permanent brick building, where all this was on view later, became one of the buildings of Washington University. At the fair, the main buildings of the quadrangle was the fair's administration building. The total cost of the World's Fair represented a tremendous venture for St. Louis. However, I remember that several years later, when final balance sheets were published and when Forest Park had been restored to its original condition, there was no deficit that had to be met by the taxpayers of St. Louis. In other words, the fair had been financially successful. The cost of those palaces and dollar values of 1900 doesn't seem impressive now until translated into present day values. Thus, a $200,000 structure could perhaps be duplicated today for $3 million. The eye appeal and beauty of the buildings at the fair was, however, only external. Inside, there was no palatial splendor, merely great areas for exhibits. Nevertheless, the enterprise and civic pride that made this exposition possible was phenomenal. It proved to be the last of the really great world's fairs. I saw the Chicago Fair of 1934 and the one in New York and was impressed. However, neither could be compared to the St. Louis Fair of 1904 in splendor or in magnitude. Here was harmony of design, yet without monotony. Though most of the palaces were of the classical tradition, Nevertheless, each one had an individual character of its own. For me, at my youthful and impressionable age, it wasn't merely memorable, but in addition to that, a highly educational experience. From now on, I knew what classical architecture meant, not merely from illustrations in a textbook. No, I had seen it, experienced it in actuality, and in handsome, well-conceived surroundings to boot. The fair had no lofty Acropolis crowned with a Parthenon, but it did have Festival Hall, its temple to the muse of music. On a central elevation at the apex of tiers of cascades that lead the eye upward to its dome chrome culmination. No wonder, therefore, that it was painful for me to think about the impermanent nature of all this splendor. Why hadn't it been built to endure? Father explained that durability required solid masonry and steel instead of fragile plaster over wood. The stationery was neither marble nor bronze. Analogies in creation were mentioned. 
how quickly fades the finest bloom. Uncle George's night blooming cactus, for instance, how ephemeral in the shimmering colors of a butterfly. Many months after the closing date, our newspaper reported with pictures that the Ferris wheel had been blasted with dynamite and was to be sold for scrap. Oh, why such vandalism? I read on and found out that all of his cars had been saved for they were saleable and could be used as lunchrooms or perhaps little shoe repair shops. A lesson in practical economics becomes comprehensible. Yes, maintaining the Ferris wheel required a steady stream of paying patrons, which only grand scale fare might provide. One learns and learning one accepts. Let me close with a final unforgettable memory. Nightfall at the fair. This is a peak experience after a long, tiring day. All buildings, except the Pike, are closed. Thousands of visitors are strolling on the grass, on the avenues, on the central plaza, resting on benches or lounging. As daylight fades, all of us watch enthralled as one by one, the palaces flash into brilliant, fiery outline. Thousands of electric light bulbs grace their familiar shapes, creating an even more scenic magic scene than daylight had revealed. For us, living during the infancy of electricity illumination, this is a truly dazzling spectacle. I might say, especially for us from rural non-electric homes, we find it hard to leave the scene and to be off homeward bound, tired, but at the same time filled with appreciation for what we had seen and experienced. Farewell, a long farewell to all thy glory, thus David R. Francis, president of the fair, at its final illumination, just as its lights went out from for the last time. Paraphrase the world's words of Cardinal Wolsey. Fallen from grace before Henry VIII, and thus I heard Father read them to us from the newspaper on the following morning. The World's Fair had ended. Goodbye to all its greatness. So how many people had an experience listening to their parents or grandparents tell about stories when they were a little kid? Anything like this? Several. Can you imagine a man 84 years old, and I'm only I'm a decade away from that, more than a decade away from that. I don't remember much when I was 12, <laughs> for sure. Um, does anybody have any questions about the presentation or uh, for Armin? Uh, and I'll be glad to answer to. What school did you go to? Did, what school did, did Armin what go to? Did you go? Yeah. Yeah, the army go just so, somewhere in St. Charles, Francis Fallon. You don't know where. How did you get from the fair? How did you get from St. Charles to the fair? Well, I, I, we rode our horse and carriage. Oh, you took your horse mm -hmm. and carriage? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's what my that's recollection what is. Okay, okay. It, it could be that I, I believe you missed something. There. It could be that there was a train. There was a train. There was a train. It went over north side of St. Charles. It's the Wabash. Now it's the Norfolk Southern, but mm -hmm. that bridge, that oh, second bridge, yeah. and that one was there mm -hmm. then. Wow. And that would have taken you to the fair down, didn't go as far as Union Station, didn't have to go that far. But that took you there. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the streets, but yeah. Uh, but that was, there was railroads that went into the fair from. All over all the major railroads when the I'm a railroad nut and I follow mm -hmm. this stuff. And, uh, but I, I was wondering where Francis House School did you where was your connection with that? Well, it, it's just my recollection that did you go to his school uncle there? was teaching there. Did you go to school there, or was you a teacher? Uh, well, wasn't your father a teacher up there was for a, teacher a long time? I, I assume I, I I assumed that my recollection was would be that I went to school there. Well, yes, I went to school there. <laughs> well, then, then you lived in well the Springs area of St. Charles, so that's where that's where it is, and all, it has always been. That would be quite a ways from that train track. It would, 
you know, what did you do after you got on the train? What did you do with your horse and buggy? Well, I wonder what they did with horses and buggies once they got downtown. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was liver stables. Yeah. There were liver stables, and they had electric cars. So there were there were stables for electric cars just a few years later. They, they, they put the cars inside so they could charge them. There's okay. History's been interesting. <laughs> right. Okay. Rushing back, stand up and uh, speak loud so the microphone will pick you up. Okay, so I don't, sadly, I've seen so many pictures that I don't remember, but I got fascinated watching the background what looked like a wooden roller coaster. Was there a roller coaster at the fair? Oh, yes, yes. Okay, I didn't, I've never heard that before. Okay, thank you. The scenic railway was a wooden roller coaster along the pipe. And it also had a, uh, a separate attraction, that big log flume, uh -huh. the shoot the shoots. Yes. What was your father's first name? Uh, oh, my goodness. I will have to look through my recollections. <laughs> Dad, right? Dad. 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 Dr. Lewis Goldman is what it says. Goldman? Goble, G O E D E L. And then I have another question for you. Were any of those auto buses preserved? I, I don't know. I think you can find them at the, at the Museum of Transportation. If I can interrupt a little bit. Uh, back in 2013, uh, I don't know how many of you folks keep your bulletins going back 10 or 15 years. <laughs> But if you look in 2013, you will find not pink, but some green inserts. And over the course of six months, we took this narrative, we, Larry, took this narrative and pieced it out and put some pictures to go with it uh, with a little more extensive introduction. And uh, Armin, you were just a little mistaken. You might have been remembering your uncle. Your father was a noted educator, Lewis Sager. He taught in a one-room schoolhouse for 53 years in the Francis Howell School District. Don't know what school. Might have been multiple schools. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's memories like this that they could have been sold for this or that, except for the fact that number one, uh, they were made with a framework of very heavy duty, very strong steel I-beams. Each Ferris wheel car weighed 13 tons. Oh. This wasn't something you could pick up and put on you know, your little wagon or take apart very easily. Uh, the Chicago House Wrecking Company owned them. There is a story that the plate glass was taken off of them and sold to a man up uh, on the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Upper Michigan border, and that he used the plate glass to build a very large greenhouse. Uh, it's been reported that somebody went up there, they seen some remnants of the house, but the greenhouse didn't last probably more than 20 or 30 years. As for the cars, the wrecking company owned them, and just like when they blew up the Ferris wheel, as you saw, all of that steel had moderate value as scrap metal and at 13 tons per car times 36 i can't do the math that fast but that's a whole lot of uh salvageable uh steel that can be melted down and reused instead of being refined and uh, melted down from scratch so my suspicion is the cars were <clears throat> you know scrapped eventually because i don't think anybody could afford to pay the scrap value even to make a little uh, lunchroom or something like that. <laughs> That's just my thoughts. And I think Steve Schmitz, our Ferris wheel expert would uh, echo that. Any other questions? How, how big were these cars physically? How many feet? Ah, were they? how big were the cars? Okay. Like a bus. Um, school bus. Let me see. 
Uh, I can do this real quickly. Five, 10, 15, 16. And that's probably about 26 feet over there to the wall, third door duck. This was the size of one of the cars. We can take everybody, everybody in here. Everybody here could get in the car. It'd be a little warm and close, but uh, <laughs> we could probably fit uh, the people here. How many have we got here, David? Where are you? Oh, I, I kept us away. Okay. <clears throat> so to have a family of you know four or five people on a car all to themselves, so that you could just go to any window you wanted. Uh, the chairs were supposedly wire stools, kind of like in a uh, candy or ice cream shop that uh, supposedly rotated. I don't know that they could be moved around. And there was one other mistake in this recollection. We left it in there for authenticity. And Doug, the engineer, probably knows what it was. Oh, go ahead. I, I, I remembered it while I was reading it. But... Uh, when he talked about the uh, dirigible being powered by a guy pedaling a bicycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. The guy was a bicyclist because he was very thin, uh, Roy Navenshoe, but there was an electric motor that powered the propeller that pulled it through the air. And in fact, when the electric motor quit, he just floated like a balloon and eventually came down <laughs> on one flight. Yes? Mike, how much was an annual pass? Well, you could buy a season pass and you had a right to buy a season pass if you bought a share or uh, one or more shares of stock. For $10, you got one share of stock and you had the right to buy tickets either at a monthly basis and you could, I guess, get, uh, what, 20 or 30 tickets uh, or a season pass would be a full 180 days that the fair would be open six days a week. And you would buy those at half price instead of 50 cents a day, it would be 25 cents to get in. But that would have been a, still a substantial outlet. The fair would make money on you, you know, walking through the gate every time. And I think there were probably more uh, monthly or, you know, if somebody came up here, weekly passes, you know, sold than there were season tickets. But uh, that's just my opinion. And each booklet looks similar in that shape but they had different words on them, whether it was a season pass or whatever. Of course, some of the bigger companies downtown probably bought season packets for uh, tickets for several of their employees and their executives. Now, th this one didn't show it, but the season passes I've seen had a person's picture in. Oh, yes. So each set of tickets, that was your identity. You, know? <laughs> you had to look like that picture or you wouldn't get in. <laughs> Um, I don't have it on this particular presentation, but uh, that one is a stockholder's coupon ticket booklet. I don't know if that means like a season pass or whatever, but you open it up and yes, it had not only your picture, black and white picture in it, it was stamped and embossed so that you couldn't transfer it to someone else. And when you went through the turnstiles, you had to tear off the ticket for that day and they would look at your picture to make sure this is you. You couldn't just give it to, you know, your friend to go. More questions? How does the Ferris wheel that's downtown in the Union Station compare to this in size? Do we know? Yes. Okay. Um, about three years ago when the downtown... How does the okay. wheel downtown at Union Station compare to the one at the fair? Um, somewhere I have a slide in a different presentation that we, we, I guess we didn't show it to the kids when we did the school presentations. Uh, height wise, it's 200 feet compared to 260 feet. Uh, so it was, you know, 80% as tall. Uh, it has almost the same number of cars, I think 30 instead of 36. Each car, they say, can hold eight people. How many people have been on the St. Louis wheel? Do you think you could fit eight people in there? No, there were three of us. Boy, it'd be like going up the arch with five people in there and everybody's knees knocking. Six people is comfortable, but uh, they probably don't put eight people in there. So its capacity is a whole lot less. Um, the axle is a whole lot smaller. It's stronger steel. And uh, I will put in a plug for Mr. Steve Schmitz, who has 
researched the Ferris wheel for 25 or 30 years and found the documentation and a newspaper report from 1907 that after the wheel was blasted, a reporter came down and interviewed the Chicago Wrecking Company people. And they said they had to blow off the flanges off the axle before they put it on a car to take it back to Chicago. And other letters talk about it being there until about 1918 when the torches got better and it could be cut up for scrap. So that's the best story that I can believe rather than the wrecking company whose business was salvage leaving behind something that was worth several thousands of dollars back then and taking the time to bury it just doesn't make sense. It was easier to lift it up. They knew how to lift stuff and put it on one of the nearby train cars and take it back to Chicago until they could cut it up. It yes. Would be, it would be interesting now that you talk about Ferris wheels to know, see how 1904 compares to the London Eye. Because the London Eye holds what, 20, 30, 40 people per car. I mean, they're big cars. So mm -hmm. that's, that's something we should um, research. I believe there are Ferris wheels today that can carry capacity wise a thousand or more people. Yeah. And I believe that there are some Ferris wheels that are 500 or 600 feet tall about twice as tall as our ferris wheel today there's a real competition going on what las vegas somewhere in the middle yeah, east dubai dubai yeah or Al Abu Dhabi or somewhere like yeah. that yeah so how'd you like to go to the mid east and get on a ferris wheel that's 550 feet tall and it's 125 degrees outside but the the st louis wheel does have one really really nice advantage when you get in that car it is temperature controlled it is air conditioned yeah. in the summertime, heated in the wintertime, and it's quite comfortable. Extremely comfortable, very comfortable. Yeah. And if you want, uh, you can ask to ride the black car. What's the black car? What's the black car? It has a glass bottom. I just looked up the left, the left and I, and it's 443. Okay, 443. <laughs> What yeah. Is this? I don't remember how many people it held. It held a lot. Yeah. Not 60. Yeah. I don't think. And it's all open. It's all glass. Yeah. But I don't think anyone has beat the capacity of the St. Louis yeah. World's Fair wheel at over 2,160 people. Any more questions? Ferris wheel or otherwise? Anyone mind? Well, I want to thank Doug again for uh, his great job of narrating Armin Sager. Up over here on this side of the piano, I'm going to ask Armin to do one last thing, and that's the attendance prize drawings. Oh, I forget my opinion. I'm like all 84 year olds, right? <laughs> So if your name is called, come and you can pick out uh, one of the books, uh, a couple pieces of china, and a spoon that we have. Reva Davis. Oh, Reva. Reva, you can pay him uh, after the. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I go now? Yes, you can go pick pick whichever one you want. Jane Peeber. Jane Peeber. She was here last month, but uh, the Peebers are not here. Yvonne Seuss. Oh, how, how coincidental oh, is that? <coughs> First two corners. That, where are you going to sit next time? Yeah. Oh, careful of the choir. Steve Vitale. Ah, Steve, come on down. How many is that we got? Uh, we got two more after Steve, I think. Steve's going to pick a book. Oh. Nobody and nobody. <laughs> no, no. Let's hang on to those. They belong in a different box. Yes. Jeanette Greider. Oh. She's here. Cool. Uh, one more. Oh, we also have a CD of 1904 music featuring a lot of Scott Joplin piano and Sousa marches. Oh, 
I can't believe three people sitting in the front row closest to the aisle, Sandy Shear. Oh, I, 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 I was going to say, I never went. Ah, <laughs> uh, likely story. Oh, right. Watch. Uh, oh, so where's the CD? Right here. Is there still a book? Oh, okay. uh, is there one more? Okay, we got uh, one more kind of contemporary book from the 1970s. <laughs> I, I don't believe you got three people in the room. <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't look what I was doing there. Kathy? I swear. <laughs> okay, all you people in back, you should have sat right to the front. <laughs> Yes, question in back. I want to give a little shout out to the lady in the audience. And she's sitting over here and she came in her great grandmother's dress from last month. Last month. Last month. So I just think that everybody who was here and got to see that, it was pretty special. Yeah, it was. I think we put that in the bulletin. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, doing that. <coughs> Okay, um, before I uh, talk about upcoming meetings, uh, does anyone else have any questions for Armin or information about the society Thank meetings, you, etc. <laughs> great, yes. great job. And David, one more time, how many people we got here 40 something? 44 and 25. That's about 70 people.